All right, should we start? Are we ready? Okay. Hello, everyone. This is the Rails new social environment lunchtime conversation that's happening at one o'clock New York time daily. Um, today, I'm thrilled to have as our very, very special superstar guest, Lisa Yuskovich, um, to talk about her work. Um, and we're also going to talk about my experience with her work um, over the years um, to get, really get the heart of the matter. This can last 45 minutes, an hour or more. We're going to try to finish in like a half an hour to leave time for questions. Um, the Rails uh, on the spot everyday aspiration is to ask friends from different fields or discipline as they appear in the rail from field notes, art scene, critics page, art books and books section music, dance, film, theater, poetry, fiction, and Artonic, which is the bi-monthly profile on artist foundations and non-for-profits, while getting the maximal pleasure out of this strange time. My name is Terry R. Myers. I'm an editor-at-large at, of The Rail, and um, I am your host for today. And Sophia Pedlau will be our MC. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. I'm thrilled to say we have hit 200 participants for today and hope to see many more. We'll I want to try to crash the site. Yeah, <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> it might happen. Uh, we'll be recording this for the Rail Archive and for YouTube, so if you don't wish to be seen, please turn off your video in the bottom left corner. Um, we'll keep the audience on mute until the question section, which will come about half, half an hour in. Um, as you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and I will be calling on people for that moderated moment. And then at the very end, we will close with a poem, as is traditional. Um, over to you, Terry and Lisa. Great, thank you, thank you, Sophia. So Lisa and I reconnected on the phone last yesterday for about a half an hour and had, I think, a very lively, reminiscing um, mind meld. So Lisa had an amazing plan for what we're gonna do. So we're gonna try to stick to that plan. And funnily enough, the plan sort of starts here where I'm at in Los Angeles. So Lisa, why don't you, I, it was so great how you just launched into it with me yesterday. So I, it, let, let's well, just I, do that again. I always associate Terry, um, just to say, you know, Terry and I have known each other and I would like to say I've always admired Terry and um, just, you know, it, it has a lot of meaning, this uh, thing going back to the early 90s when you know, there wasn't a large audience in the art world and you pretty much knew people who were coming and going and looking at your shows and it had a lot of meaning. And then those people who have seen and participated over the years and see a lot of different contexts and, um, you know, our lives have, you know, it's since, you know, uh, apparently he saw the very first show at Pamela Auchincloss and was at that opening, but, we were talking about Los Angeles because I always associate you with the Los Angelian, but apparently you're not from Los Angeles originally. You're no. from New York. Indiana. Right? I'm Indiana. A okay. But at any rate, uh, what people don't realize about uh, my career is that it, though I had a show in New York, uh, the art world pretty much collapsed. Hello. Um, and um, everything dried up and there were no opportunities. And if you did not, if you wanted to show, you kind of went where the love was. And um, a man named Christopher Grimes, who I hope is somewhere out there, because I called him yesterday to say, come online. Um, he had a gallery and asked for me to uh, have a show there. And um, it was 1994. And we have an image of, um, we got sent some images of, of from Christopher of the install. So we can actually flash those for you. Um, can you go to full screen, guys, so that you can see the, or is that not possible? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, so these, these paintings uh, were made in New York and shown in Los Angeles. And I had several shows in Los Angeles because no one in New York would show my work. Um, and uh, apparently Terry was at that opening as well. And we may have spoken. So the painting, uh, Big Bond. It's hmm? the month I moved from New York to LA the month you moved and happened to be there. So you were sort of stalking me without yes. me knowing. So it, 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 it's a body of work that, you know, I feel like um, still when I look at it, I'm like, wow, that, that was strong work for a person in your early thirties. Yeah. And also, you know, with very little or no support, none of these paintings 
maybe one of them sold. Um, and then uh, we had a funny story about one of them coming back from a group show in Russia with paw prints, all of, ha dirty handprints, Russian handprints, uh, the yellow painting. So it was just a, an interesting moment in my life. And I love that Terry was there. Yeah. And um, what I would add to that is that we were just um, talking before we went live about, you know, I was in um, graduate school at CUNY in the late 80s. And I'm a runaway from that program. Robert Pincus Witten said to me once, you know, you're already downtown, you're doing what you want to do, you don't need to do the big book report. So mm -hmm. I left that PhD program in art history because all the faculty left, Rosam Krauss, Linda Nochlin, everyone left. Anyway, cut that. So New York was very strange in the early 90s. And I wasn't sure, and I had this opportunity to get a teaching job at Otis in LA. So I moved to LA and I remember New Yorkers being like, where are you going? You know, like they just <laughs> couldn't wrap their head around. Yeah, it wasn't an so, art world destination right. um, at all. So, but I remember Lisa's work, you know, from the, the first show was a sort of separate thing. She changed her work radically. So coming, it's coming back to me as, you know, that to move here and have sort of Lisa be the first show at Christopher's Gallery, which Christopher became, you know, a friend, a great, a great gallery, showed so many amazing people in Santa Monica. And, you know, to um, be someone who had landed into an L.A. art scene that was beginning to mature. But also, I would say, an L.A. art critic scene that really was um, not very robust at that point. But getting there, thanks to people like Gary Kornblau, who started Art Issues. And I saw Lisa, one of the reviews for this show was from Art Issues. Um, and um, Dave Hickey, particularly writing for Art Issues, is what sort of brought that. But it was really Christopher Knight in the LA Times. I remember he told me once, you know, criticism comes on the plane and it leaves on the plane in this town. You know, so to have Lisa's work in that environment, I thought was amazing. I did not get a chance to write about it, but Lisa sent me the reviews yesterday and other LA critics did in quite, um, let's say, interesting ways. And Lisa, I'd like to hear you like talk about it first before I weigh in. Well, just, like, you know, I, I, of course, I'm always, the thinking, response I'm always thinking about, the, the, yeah, because um, that's one of the things, since you are an art critic and a curator and, um, and criticism has always been a topic around my career, like, you know, lover or hater, that kind of thing, you know, people sort of bring up the criticism. Um, and I know that, you know, I'm sort of um, kind of born, 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 you know, died in the wool sort of teacher. I'll never stop, you know, I, I, I'm not teaching, but I'm always sort of thinking about how this can be an interesting conversation for younger artists. Um, but the, but the review. Uh. <laughs> who, um, came in on my fax machine. No, the first, the other one, the one from Art Forum. And, um, oh, I'm getting a note that says my internet connection is unstable. Well, that happens fun. to all of us. That's fun. It happens um, to all of us, Lisa. <laughs> anyway, um, so this review came in through my fax machine and I read it. It was a kind of, and I basically, you know, re was reading these words, not since the days of bad painting has someone tried as hard as Lisa Scavage to make a travesty of the medium. And I thought, that's good, right? <laughs> and and it goes on to, I mean, this is such a beautiful piece of writing. And what I felt was, I felt like I was a uh, fastball and Lane Relio was a crackerjack, uh, took a really, took a home run swing at me and hit it really fucking hard. And I loved it. I didn't mind the beating. Actually, I didn't think it was a beating at first, to be honest. My husband, Matt Faye, said, you know, this is a bad review. And I was like, no, it's not. It's a good review. No, it, it's not, no. No, no, but he said, he said it was, um, but there's a really wonderful piece here where it says, um, giving criticality, I sort of have it memorized because I've repeated it so many times, Cri to attribute a critical position to Yuskavage's canvases seems a cowardly response, like reigning in an outlaw by deputizing them. How great is that? Yeah. I wanted to be an outlaw. And, you know, and yes, I was getting reined in by being deputized by 
him, which I shook his hand once at a party. It was sort of like, thank you. And, you know, I don't think it was necessarily the response um, a critic who writes something wants. But um, as you get older, as you were saying, Terry, that you become very interested in how you got things wrong and how you come back to things. But at any rate, the important part for me about the criticism, you can go to the other review, which um, was there, came up, which, you know, also says strange things about and my right I, to offend uh, everybody. Hmm? Can I just interject here? What I didn't remember until you sent this, I was the California editor immediately at the New Art Examiner. I said yes to this woman writing this review. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know what she was going to say, she'll be turned it in, but I was, the, I was in charge of the California reviews. Well, so I said yes, she wanted to do your show, and I'm like, absolutely, Lisa Scottish. Yeah, well, I... Don't, I don't know if I met Jacqueline Cooper, and um, but the thing is, I really loved the idea. It's, I think one of the hardest things for an artist is silence. And if you get a response at all, you have succeeded. Even if it's to have someone, um, I just realized I spit at the computer. Can I give you guys Corona from that? I just... <laughs> 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 anyway, um, I, I, I realized like to be connecting to people and even if they don't like it, it was a privilege and it was, it was a privilege that I always, um, always understood even now. It's, 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 it's something that you should, you know, I, I didn't actually make these paintings to be reacted to. I made these paintings for my own, um, need to see something that was brewing in my own head about uh, art itself and the world outside of me and things that I, I it, one, one thing I actually said to somebody a while ago about these paintings that seems to have stuck was um, what, 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 um, what I was going around looking at a lot of art um, and I realized there was an object that I wanted to see made that when I would be going around um, galleries that I never saw, I would see aspects of things. And then um, suddenly I realized, well, that's your job as an, as an artist is to make, instead of complaining about how uninteresting what you're seeing is or where you're not getting something, you should, that's your job, go to your studio and make the thing you wish you could see. Um, and so that is the um, that is the project at hand is to make something you want uh, you wish would be in the world. Right. So that's where a lot of these objects came from. Lisa, can I just interject a couple things mm -hmm. that you're provoking? One is my still I tell one of my favorite moments as a young critic back in the days I was living on Stanton Street around the corner where the new museum is now pre. I think I had an answering machine with a cassette tape to record the messages. Right. But I picked the pre-caller ID. So I, my phone rings, I pick up the phone and someone says, is this Terry Myers? And I said, yes. And they said, fuck you. And they hung up the phone. And I was like, <laughs> yes. I was like, yes. And I remember telling all my friends, like, someone called, it must have been something I wrote. I don't know, something. And I was like, happy all day because I, it's like, I wanted a response too. Like I walked, like I was like, okay, someone felt the need to do that. Second well, thing I want to say is that Lisa, your work was very key for me at that point, even though I never got the chance to write about it specifically, because I don't know if you remember in the early nineties, my great, amazing friend and the best editor I've ever worked with, Tavia Fort. Um, she and I co-wrote, Barry Schwabsky let us co-write a two-page article in arts called White Boy as Abstraction, Do We Really Need Another New York School? And it was about this, what we were sensing is this kind of, they were bringing all the white boy artists, a lot of painters, back into, like, this is what we all had to pay attention to, what right at the that? height of what the year Virgin, was that? 91 or 92. 91 or 90, it was two pages. The only image we used was a Sue Williams painting called Mrs. Action Painter, which is this like smiley housewife, this man's ass over her head and this brown paint just running down her face. Mm -hmm. That was the photo, that was the image we used. We didn't name any of the male artists by name. We just described their work because as we put in the, in the, in the text, 
we didn't want anyone to any of them to be able to add it to their CVs. <laughs> so um, that your work, because you know, let's take someone like John, for example, John Curran, you know, that moment, your work was like everyone wanted to bring you together. And I was like, no, Lisa's up to something else here. So then I get to LA in this different environment, a different idea about boundaries, a different idea about painting itself. And seeing your paintings really, I, would, I hope you don't mind this word, mature here in those shows. Well, sure. He, I mean, prior to these shows, I think I was... Maybe, I mean, can we go to looking at the paintings? Yeah, let's look at yeah. the paintings. So, but prior to this, I had a show at um, Elizabeth Corey where I think I really began the work. Uh, we don't have images of it here, but if anybody goes to... True. I my, saw that too. Yeah. My website, you added some? No, I saw that show too, though, before I left. That was before I left. You get around. No, the, the, the other one, you guys. This is um, the later early, one. The earlier PDF of early work, guys. Um, so it would have been the first PDF I sent you guys. Um, at any rate, um, I think that, yeah, I think that the, the work that you saw initially at, um, at uh, Auchincloss was, I realized, you know, um, it may have been interesting or solid work. You can scroll through these uh, images, um, but, they, but they were um, still my kind of coming out of being a student. And um, I think being being a student simply means that you're still um, thinking about pleasing a mentor somehow or answering to someone. And I think the experience of getting out of school and also the absolute nothing, um, the, the the loud, the loudness of co the quiet of nobody gives a shit about what you're doing, um, made me really take stock and I better really do what I want to do and nobody cares so you might as well do what you want and that you know that freedom really brought me to do these paintings that were sort of like a, a conflation of everything I'd wanted to do you know um, you know keeping making uh, light a subject a tenderness but also kind of like a, a kind of a this uh, after the Aachen class show um, I thought I wasn't going to paint anymore and it's funny because one of my dearest friends, Sarah Z, who I've talked to now, you know, at least weekly for the past 20 years, told me she's never heard this story, which I'm like, I tell the story like a hundred times, but nonetheless, she was like here the other day, we spent six feet apart, which she was like, you know, you look good from six feet, <laughs> Just six feet distance, you look good. But um, we were, uh, she was, I was telling her the story about how when I got, a, when I did that show of those paintings of the backs, the student paintings that I kind of, re, you know, um, had to reinvent myself from with this work and the um, Elizabeth Corey work, the Bad Babies. Um, I was thinking, uh, you know, I was, I was really sort of like thinking about sort of like how I could make something, well, basically what it was is that I knew that the things I wanted to make art about um, were, were, were interesting and, 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 and authentic and real and worth pursuing. I thought that somehow painting and the medium of painting screwed me up somehow, like that it turned me in the earlier, I'm talk, not talking about these paintings, I'm talking about the earlier paintings in, in the Aachen class show. Unfortunately, guys, we don't have those here. We, we promised ourselves we weren't going to talk about those, but as a point of reference. I'm not talking about them, I notice. Okay, that's, <laughs> sorry. But the, but the point is, if anybody wants to look at those, those are, they're on my website, it, there's a, uh, a, a tab for exhibitions and it shows that body of work. But at any rate, I, I really thought maybe I was going to become a filmmaker. And that was the other thing is that, you know, I think that eventually, and the work that we're going to talk about that is in a show now at the Aspen Art Museum, uh, which only, I guess, you know, the uh, mice and the guards are looking at because it's closed, and we'll come to Baltimore, and hopefully all will be back to normal in the fall. Um, we, we, I started to realize how much the cin this, uh, the cinema, you know, uh, cinematography and kind of my interest in film actually later came into the work. And when I look back on my work and I look at these more iconic images of a single figure standing, you know, in a kind of a very simple sumato, 
I realize that in some level, and I'm not 100% certain about this, but I look back on my work and I realize, I think that I was casting my actors back in this point. And later, I, and, and I was really just thinking about who, who would you work, who would be in your story? What is, what is in the story? What is it? I don't really think of my work as having narrative, but, um, you know, um, I was really interested in um, the ways in which I could put these things later, probably closer to the year 2000. Um, I had a show called Northview at Marianne Bosky Gallery, and for the first time, the figures were interacting with each other. There were three or four figures in a room, and the room was really defined. It took me until about 2000 to actually move away from um, something like this where I was casting. and. Um, some of these figures kind of return in the more recent work. Right, Lita, um, Christopher is here. I saw him. Hi, Christopher. Uh, somebody, C somebody put Sophia, Christopher. he's C, C. Grimes. Yep, that would that'd be Christopher. Somebody gonna let Christopher talk? Hey, Christopher, look at that landscape. You hey, Christopher. <laughs> hey, Stop. Chris, how are hey. you? Good to see you. I'm so we want, you, you're, you're, I would love to hear you talk about these. But these. give give a little bit of background. Christopher was the man who um, showed these paintings uh, in '94, and also I think in '96. '96. Yeah. '96. Yeah. So Christopher, what was what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the thing that always interested me in your work was your your skill as a painter. I think that that was, and not to mention the subject matter was obviously provocative, but um, I, coming from San Francisco um, and kind of growing up, going to the Art Institute and smelling the oil, walking around through those uh, hallways there, it was, just had a, an interesting history of painting. Mm. And I've always respected your, um, your knowledge, your breadth of knowledge as a painter, and uh, the skill that you bring to the subject matter. Obviously, the subject matter is, I think, the central tenet of the conversation, but I think that you uh, convey it in such a, a convincing and, and provocative way that it's, um, that, that's what makes the work, and that's what gives the work its strength. I was telling so, Terry. I was telling Terry about, and I, I mentioned this to you on the phone yesterday. Um, how uh, this big blonde squatting painting, which is six feet square, and actually it's painted on a canvas that I inherited from my best friend who died of AIDS. He was interested in circles in a square, and that was kind of his name is Jesse Murray, and so the circle in a square kind of inspired. So that's the way inspiration works. Is like it comes from all different levels and different places, but I inherited this square, six foot square canvas. And before he died, he had seen what I was doing. And he said, I can't wait to see these color fields become actual large color fields. And I was too broke to buy a big canvas. And then I inherited one that he hadn't worked on. And that was how I got to this um, scale. And at any rate, he was correct. It worked even better on a bigger scale. Um, and then um, I remember when we shipped this painting and the rest of the paintings to Los Angeles. And I think I was being provocative because that's how I roll as a person. And I was thinking about California, which I actually had never been to California in my life until I showed up for my show with you. And I got off the airplane and got to Santa Monica. Absolutely loved everything about it. I was like, this is the best place. Why don't I live here? And I still feel that way sometimes. <laughs> and then I um, was kind of scared about the reception. I was also being a little bit of a jerk because I think I painted this painting like a big blonde because I thought of, I was anticipating a lot of blondes in the audience because it's California. It's sort of a silly idea, but it was like big blonde <laughs> squatting. <laughs> and then I get there and there's a woman looking at this painting, which um, was smack in the middle of that wall. Um, and I walked in, I was like, uh oh, this woman is gonna beat me up. And this lovely woman turns around and says, Hi, are you Lisa Scavage? And I said, Yes. She goes, I'm Kathy Opie. 
And I love this show. This is great. And it was so great. I mean, that was sort of what that experience was like. It's like all the artists came out and it was such a small community and it was so, um, lo- it was, it was the artist loved it and everybody else kind of had to like wrangle what they were going to do professionally in terms of siding. Um, but at any rate, uh, we could move to, uh, more recent work, but do you have anything else you wanted to add, Chris? Well, I, I would imagine that that audience at that time would have been an interesting, um, place to show this work. Obviously you weren't showing it in, in New York where everybody knew what everybody else was doing and your work was so distinct from anything else that had been done or shown. And I think that that there was a particular freedom at that time um, in showing the work in, in Los Angeles, I would imagine. I mean, you, you would know this better than me, but yeah. um, I would agree yeah. with that a hundred percent. And I showed in Los Angeles yeah. almost exclusively and, you know, became known as a Los Angeles artist. And I remember going to a party um, and Friedrich Petzl, it was a party at Nicola Tyson's. And when she had that gallery trial balloon in her loft and they had right. Nicole Eisenman drawings on the wall, very cool early days. And I remember Friedrich saying to me, hey, you're in from LA. And I was like, I'm not from LA. <laughs> and he's like, you're not? Aren't you an LA artist? I was like, my art is in LA for the most part, but I'm here. I was born in Philadelphia and I'm a New Yorker now. So he was like, that's odd. I've always thought you were an LA artist. So um, maybe I should give it a try one of these days being an LA artist. Always once before, before I, sure. um, you could, but, but thank, thank you really love that land, Christopher. Thanks for the, you know, jealousy inducing background but we were going to talk about more recent work and then yeah, can, can I just quickly say any of you who are on this if you don't know about Christopher's gallery and the, the legacy and what he's done you know he brought so much important art to Los Angeles that no one else did a lot of people now have owe him so much and he deserves so much credit his work with artists from Central and South America so on and so forth. The gallery really was, and I forget, Christopher, refresh my memory, how many years total? The gallery? 40? Yeah. 40? I mean, you know, I just wanted yeah. to put okay. that up there too. <laughs> anyway, you, the, Terry. The, the, the gallery is now in a different format. He's doing something up in the mountains there. Um, and I have a guest bedroom <laughs> with my name on it, I know. Um, but at any rate, we're going to, we're going to move on to, uh, this, uh, more recent work. Um, can you guys just flip through it? So, um, I, I, only because, you know, talking about the past is amazing, but, you know, I just thought we would talk about the, the, the work that's, uh, you know, in this show. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it is that when I looked at the show, actually, we couldn't get this outskirts painting, um, cause it was in Russia and, uh, I think it was just crazy Russia. to try to ship it. Russia, what's up with the Russian thing with me? Don't get me started. My father-in-law is on the call, and my mom, and dad maybe. So um, let's let's uh, you know be nice about Russians. Hi, hi, Victor. Um, anyway, um, outskirts we couldn't necessarily get out of Russia, but it was it's an important painting in this body of work. But as I walked through, just keep going through these images, guys. So as I walked through the exhibition and was doing walkthroughs, one of the things I kept saying. And I've been getting emails from the staff at the Aspen Art Museum, um, just keep moving them, is um, there's a painting called Tragic Land that I stop and talk about. And I said, you know, or this painting, Big Pile Up. Um, I said, you know, the show should have been called Apocalypse Now. And I realized that since 2000, around the earliest painting in the show, I think is 2006. This painting, this red painting, go back for a sec, this red painting, it's called Walking the Dog. And there's some details, um, which you know I don't have here, but I actually posted them when I did the show on my Instagram. But there's like, if you look all the way, I'm pointing on my own screen. If you look all the way in the distance, uh, when you, if you, you can also see it on my website much clearer. There's a person walking a dog in the distance. And at the time, I did this painting, I think 2000 and, oh yeah, I have it down there, 2009. Um, I did not know that how, I, I was actually going to be trying to find a way to walk my dog in the apocalypse. Um, so I, you know, you make all these jokes and, you know, Freud always said, you know, got to watch out for the jokes. But I think this, um, I was 
you know, one of one of one of the team members in Aspen said to me, you know, yeah, we're trying to walk the dog in this in this moment. And you said that the other day. It was about four weeks ago or five weeks ago. And this painting ditch, um, you know, like trying to ask yourself, why was I painting a pregnant woman who was disposed of in in a at the bottom of a pile of rocks with some sort of weird thing going on. That's a small painting on the right and a large painting on the left. I mean, when I looked at the show, I, I just could see kind of a theme that had been running through me. And I realized we, you know, being a New Yorker or an American, you know, even a person on the earth from 2001 going from 9-11 and you're like, you know, what's going on? And Hurricane Sandy, you know, shook many of us to the core. And I think that that started to, you know, a lot of these images are, you know, pre-Sandy, but kind of felt like very prescient when I was making them. And now we have, you know, these weird images that keep coming back to me. So I, 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 I was um, kind of weirded out that I said about walking the dog, because it is hard to walk the dog. <laughs> Don't want anybody to pet your dog, because apparently you can pass germs on your dog. So, um, yeah, and this painting nest was, you know, kind of, you know, it's like people were asking me, where do these images come from? And I had this whole um, conversation about how I was very interested, since I had been a student um, in, in, in Italy um, in, in the uh, er, move, nine, early 1980s, I was gonna say the early 2000s, early 1980s as a student in Italy, and I went to uh, Venice and I saw, um, the Giorgione Tempest painting, and and really it really altered the way I thought about narrative because the Tempest, um, Giorgione's Tempest, has you know a mother, a naked mom sitting out there in the landscape, exposed, suckling her baby, and then there's a guard who doesn't seem to be aware of her, and she's not aware of him, and then there's um, a thunderbolt, and there's a big tempest coming, and you just trying to puzzle out what is the meaning of this. And there's such a thing in psychotherapy, psychoanalysis called a TAT test, T-A-T test. And they present to you, um, if you take one of these tests, which I did do years and years ago to get pretty much free psychotherapy at NYU, you have to submit to a battery of tests. It's worth it. Um, and you go through this and they show you images and it's like almost like the Tempest where it'd be like, a kid and his mother and something else happening and you had to make up a story and I said oh this is like the tempest so I always thought it would be kind of so apparently it's supposed to show you something about your inner life and so part of what rules my uh, understanding about how to make work is that I do not have to um, before during or after know what the paintings are about but I have sort of instincts about putting things together that that it's almost like I'm doing a reverse tat test. So um, things that make sense to me formally, it's a different story. I have to kind of make a certain amount of logic formally. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Lisa, uh, yeah, um, I, just to change the subject a bit, I'm struck by that. Can you go back to those for a second? I'm just struck by these two paintings being side by side. And the one on the left is nine by eight inches, and the one on the right is seventy-seven by one hundred and twenty inches. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the, you know, you and I, you brought up yesterday the show of all your small paintings, you know, the small painting, large painting discussion that painters often get asked. Like, it just is striking me that we're getting a big right. little well, one and a little right. big one. Um, and it's funny that the big one is so small here. Um, so what? what is there a question? Well, just like what, like, like, to me, I'm looking at them and I'm like, yeah, I can see how the little, the big one that's actually small is painted, you know, like I could get it, but it's just not that big of a difference. And I'm kind of stunned by how they both, like the one on the left could be the size of the one on the right and vice versa. There is a large you know? version. I mean, in person, of course, I wouldn't think that, but on right. the screen. Well, the importance, the importance of that show, if some of you saw that show at David's Warner Gallery, I, this fall, it will be two years, um, was such a great, uh, I mean, for me, it was a gift and I hope for other people it was fun and a gift too, because I mean, obviously that was almost like a museum show because a lot of those paintings were brought in from all over the world. We borrowed one from Christopher who he had 
I think it was maybe one I given you or something, but it was like things that we scrapped around and you had to find things from the early nineties. We started with a painting then that I had done at Yale the night I had actually made this painting and finished it the week I met Matvey, which was 1985. And weirdly enough, Julian Schnabel was a visiting artist at Yale. That was the first painting in that show at the Zwerner Gallery. And Julian Schnabel, I mean, was at the absolute zenith of his painting career, as opposed to the zenith of his filmmaking career. And he um, was a painting visiting artist, and he just put on such a show for us, the young Yale kids. He came in in a fur coat with a young blonde and threw the coat to her and had like gold suspenders. I mean, you could ask anybody who was there. It was crazy. And then he went up to all the boys and said, you want to kiss right up in their face? And they were kind of like, yeah, because it was really schnabel. But then they were like, no, but then he handed them Hershey's Kisses. He, I mean, honestly, I kind of fell in love with Julian Schnabel that day, but I was making these itty bitty paintings at Yale and they were like very 19th century looking and I was making them with a little palette knife and he stopped at my painting and he said, who made this? And then he picked it up with his hands, which was so appropriate because it was so tiny. And he told me that I was holding back and told, he talked to me and, and I ran to my studio and finished the painting. And it was one of the best studio, I mean, we, we didn't do studio business. He actually said, well, I'm not gonna show slides of my work. You all know my work. Um, everybody go get a painting, come back. Anybody wants me to talk about their work. So it was so beautiful. And you know, I'm doing a Julian Schnabel promo, but it was a great moment. Um, but that painting show at Zwerner, it started with that painting. And that painting really held up. You know, I didn't like when people told me that was their favorite painting in the show after 30 or 40 years of painting there. But anyway, it still held up. And I, um, you know, and kind of we went around the room into recent paintings, but, um, and it was just like looking at how, I was the only person who knew, because I don't really even know if it kind of came clear to the people I'm working with, that there has been almost no gap since 1990, I'm sorry, 1984, that I, there's no gap when I didn't use small paintings. The only moment that I didn't do small paintings was a short period when I was doing these watercolors called Tit Heaven, which we have some images of here, because the, the side images uh, or were like something I was doing on the side, what one would call studies. At that time, I started to uh, explore watercolor. Can you guys just look for these watercolors, Tit Heaven watercolors, just the, at any rate, I, I, you know, it's, 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 we could go on and on, but you know, there you, there you have yeah. it. And also, uh, Lisa and Sophia, it's, I can tell from the chat panel, we have a ton of questions, right? Yeah, so, let's, let's, let's let other people make it, you know, make it about them, not about us. Yeah, yeah. So, Sophia, yeah. Great, yes, we have a ton of questions. It's very exciting. Um, I think I will call on E.J. Hauser first, who had an interesting question about the film. E.J., I know you know how to unmute yourself because you've already been our guest. Yeah. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Can um, we get to see her? Uh, <laughs> hiding yourself, EJ? I am. Uh, Lisa, I was curious, you talked about your kind of characters in your early work as being like actors and wondering if there was a particular filmmaker that you were really looking at or appealed to you at that moment. Actually, it was Fassbender um, because when, uh, you know, when I was a very young artist, one of the things is you don't have that much you don't have a lot of time for your studio, but you also don't have a lot of ideas. Um, you know, I hadn't, I mean, I hadn't lived enough of a life to have enough ideas in a way. So um, we would, uh, my husband and I and friends, we would go to the film farm and um, we would go see days on end uh, film festivals and Fassbender Festival and Tarkovsky Festival and you know, you name it. And we became very adept at what had been made during a certain period because the, you know, the film forum was almost like our museum. And I loved how he used Hannah Shigula. And I think Hannah Shigula as an actress and then how he reused her as like almost like a theater troupe. And I think his group was a theater troupe at one, uh, before they became a film crew. Um, but I love the idea that like she got to play different characters. I mean, of course she was always a female character. Um, which you know kind of helped bolster me. And when people said, "When are you going to paint a man?" I was like, "Well, that when Hannah Shagula plays a man," you know. And um, I was just thinking, you know, it's 
it was an interesting thing, but also um, eventually um, I came across a quote and I recently found where that damn quote was. It actually was, I've been looking through that Gustin book where it's like all of his essays and his um, conversations and I couldn't find it in there. And I'd even asked Musa Gustin if she knew there where this quote came from. And it turns out it's, it's, it's actually in the Dory Ashton book. It's not something he said, it's something she said he said. So I was rereading the Dory Ashton book on Gustin and she claims that he told her, which is why it's not a, really actually even a footnote anywhere because it's like speculation on her was on her part that he um, began to see himself um, at certain point he became very free and he started to see the characters that he had invented whether the character is just a hand pointing or a paintbrush or a palette or you know the objects or the the the, the Ku Klux Klan heads or the bean heads he saw them as actors and then he said, all I had to do was create a mise-en-scene. I just pulled the camera back and then I just let them roam around the landscape and see what kind of trouble they could get into. And I thought, trouble? I know how to get people. I know, I, know, I know something about... Anyway, it was kind of an interesting quote about... Um, he also, Gustin was also thinking, imagining um, uh, Isaac ba Babel, who... Um, Red Army and pretending to be someone he wasn't because he was a Jew and he was pretending to be the Red Army. So he was hang driving around with his enemies. So the idea that Gustin became someone who imagined himself in the um, guise of his enemy being the Klan and seeing what kind of no good they could get up to, driving around, smoking cigars, eating french fries, painting, weeping, whipping themselves. And I just was like, ooh, that's a thrill, you know? Like, what would these characters get up to? So I think that, like, it's not just film, but it's the filmic that's interesting. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your answer. I'm getting hungry. Anybody else getting hungry? I didn't eat lunch, but I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm actually probably more talkative when I'm hungry. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. We have a couple questions from Jessica Langley. Jessica, uh, do you want to unmute yourself or I'm happy to help? Um, I can also read your question. Hi. Yeah, Lisa, it's such an honor to ask you these questions and I've just been such a huge fan of your work since I started studying painting. So I had actually two questions. So I teach painting in Colorado Springs and we don't have a lot of access to um, paintings in the flesh. and. Um, now in this age of social distancing we aren't even allowed to see artwork in person um, in museums or galleries so i was wondering what you think is lost by only being able to see your work online which is typically how i show my students your work anyway or in books um, well when the museum then, opens again i want you to make a field trip to aspen okay well it's about a four hour drive but we'll try <laughs> am i not worth it you are worth it it'll be, worth, it'll be worth it i will i i will pay for the gas I hope it's still open. The show. Okay, if you go, I'm... if you go, I'll 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 write you a check for the gas. Oh, you heard you. it here. She's okay. Up. <laughs> Pinky swear. Um, seriously, um, I think it's really worth. Honestly, I will tell you this. I was a pretty. Um, when I found out at Tyler School of Art that I could go to Rome in my third year, um, I was like, that's where I'm going to school. And no one I knew had spent time in Rome. As a matter of fact, one of my grandmothers had immigrated from Italy and she was like, what do you want to go there for? The all they got in Italy is dirt. And I was like, well, actually, I think, you know, maybe where you come from in Italy is dirt. But anyway, so I said, um, I learned Italian and wild horses could not have stopped me. I worked every damn day. I modeled nude. I lifeguarded. I, you, you wanted me to do something, I did it. I, I, I sit, so what do I, hostess, I was terrible hostess, but I hosted and I did whatever. And I was like saving up money. And then I bought an airplane ticket because my parents could pay, help me with my, whatever they were already paying. But we, I, my mom said, if you want to go, you have to pay in the room and board. Cause I was, um, we call it a commuter. I, I did not live in the dorms. I felt sorry for myself, but I did not live in the dorms, which turned out to be a good thing because I had more focus because I was painting in my bedroom at home. But anyway, in 1982, I got on an airplane, flew to Rome with a bunch of kids and, tr and got a Eurail pass and traveled all over Europe and saw everything I could in the flesh. And 
I am so immeasurably, um, um, it changed my life. It was the best decision I ever made. So I think you guys can get in the car and go four hours. Well, that's, yeah, absolutely. Um, but what do you think is lost by not being able everything. to see your work? Yeah, everything, right? Okay. It's like, it's like, okay, there's something good about, you know, phone, I guess if this was, you know, in, in, an intimate moment between people, like that could be hot, but it's just, you know, it's like, it's obviously like what's missed between being able to hug a friend. Like it's what we're missing now. If you're alone, you, you know, aura. eventually we're going to wither and die if somebody, if we don't get to get together. I had drinks with friends on this format the other day. And when it was over, I got more depressed because I, I'm, you know, I'm like, yeah now we're still alone. <laughs> you know, it's like, fortunately, I have my husband and my cute dog. But I was just like, you know, this, it almost like emphasized what's going on in a weird way. So like the absence of something makes me want it even more. And I really feel like um, also, you know, when I've taught, and I went and to Columbia and I taught and this, this kid had, you know, um, what do you call it, business cards when I went there. And he had like, he was very sweet and he had like a million paintings in a studio and you know, he was a Columbia. So now he's like, you know, in the middle of all this art, right? This is maybe five, 10 years ago. And I could tell from looking at his work that he had not looked at any paintings in the flesh. In the flesh. And yeah. how could I tell is because they had the appearance. I'm not sure what we're looking at there. Is that, what is that popped up on the screen guys? Some object? Oh, don't worry. We've been taken over. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so um, the, 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 the thing I said to him is like, oh, what, what, have you been going to the Met or the Whitney or anywhere? And he's like, no, I've been working really hard in my studio. So I turned my chair away from his work and I turned towards the door and asked him to sort of put his chair in front of the door. And I said, I will talk to you, but I won't look at your work. And he said, why not? You know, you're a teacher. And I said, because you don't care enough about art to look at it. So I think like whatever it takes, I think you have to. Otherwise, you know, you're, you know, you're not, you're not doing this thing. You're just not an active participant in it. So hustle, hustle, Jessica. I can't hear you. I, I, have I lost audio on everybody? I was muted. I was oh, muted. I, oh you yeah. You muted? Were, did you I, curse me? Did somebody, somebody, were you cursing me? Like, you know, fuck <laughs> no, off. No, no. <laughs> My other question was about um, landscape and when that entered your work and why, and like how you think that changed the, I don't know, stage of your paintings. Well, I was doing um, these watercolors in the early nineties and they, and they're in this show in Aspen and they, um, inc I, we included them because they were the earliest manifestations of actual landscape elements. But all along, like when I was teaching, I would actually have people paint landscape and I would do demonstrations. And some of those demonstrations are in the show also and they you know and it was weird because in this small painting show at David's Werner that was how um the curator got the idea for the landscape painting show was because of these landscapes and like a couple people have tried you know said oh I'd like to buy one of those like the moonscape and I was like that's a demonstration from a student you, you don't really you don't really want that and like no we really want that I'm like no because those are things that I'm going to keep for my private self because I know that they you know but what I did with those with the information is like if I would be outside painting a moon and just taking in that information, later I would add that, what I learned about the light. It's always about learning about light. And yeah. Stuff like that, you know, boring stuff like that. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Good luck and get your ass to the see some art, okay? Oh, we will once this okay. is all over, hopefully. Bye. Hustle. Bye. Take care, Jessica. You too. Uh, wonderful. Next up, we have our very own Fong Bui, who would like Fong to Bui. <laughs> Uh oh, here we go. <laughs> hey, Where Lisa. Are you? See you. Hi, Fong. Hi. So, just so to follow up what your experience in Italy, Lisa, we we actually met in November two thousand three through an email, which oh yeah, um, I invited you to write on. Guston, the show of the Met. That's right. And, and I was in Rome. That's right. And but this time I was in Rome because Matvey, my husband Matvey, won the Rome Prize, and I was the fellow traveler, which is what they call you at the American Academy as the spouse. 
And I was in my studio and I got this email from this bong buoy person from some Brooklyn rail, never heard of it. But there was something appealing about your request to me, which was to ask, do you want me to write about my impressions of, of Philip Guston? Because mm. you had heard from Katie Siegel that I had some ideas about Guston, right? That was the, uh -oh. yeah. But the question is simple, Lisa, because uh, for my memory, asking in addition to absorbing all the Italian Renaissance, the old master you have seen in various museums, you also were able to absorb Guston the Chirico, Morandi, simultaneously. In other words, you talk about the theatricality of Guston ability to mobilize those actors in that so-called presenium, mm -hmm. the stage light, which is exactly how he also read Babo and how he and Dory Aston have talked about. But the fact that there, the aspect of stability, which relies so much on Morandi prop up the so-called table in the, mm -hmm. the eye level. So therefore the model appear very monumental. So I like you to remember, go back a little bit and share with us how. Well, I think that what I said about my impression of Gustin, I said because I'm in, I think maybe I said something about being in Rome, uh, and Gustin spent a lot of time at the American Academy and in Rome, especially after uh, he had that show in which he was considered a failure, uh, which of course he wasn't, it was the opposite, but you know, he didn't. Um, have commercial or uh, critical success with the show, but he um, took off and went to went to Rome, and um, I think he met um, the De Chirico. I don't think it went well or something. I don't remember exactly what the details on that were. But you, when you're in Rome, you really start to, uh, uh, and this is like yeah, I said, 2003, start to really get. Um, you know, all of the histories and the overlapping, because Rome is a place where there's um, an awful lot of visitors and there's an awful lot of people over time coming and going, coming and going. You can sort of understand all these different relationships. I mean, uh, Mirandi was not a Roman. Um, he was a Bol Bolognese uh, mm -hmm. guy. But one thing that I think I had not read anyone uh, write about Moran about um, the relationship between Mirandi and Gustin, which always occurred to me as a fan of both of these painters, um, was I saw in Gustin's late work his deployment of composition mm -hmm. from Mirandi and also touch. Mm -hmm. If you look at the paint in Mirandi, and you look at the touch in Mirandi, you almost can see Gustin taking, it's so unique. I mean, one of the things I always felt about Gustin's paintings is that pretty much there's nothing in them that you can steal visually without crashing against the rocks, almost like he's like the siren song. You will just end up making these ridiculous looking Gustin ripoffs. So that what you have to do with Gustin is take his, him almost philosophically. It's better to read Gus. I mean, of course, I love his paintings. And I'm very sad that, you know, the Gustin retrospective that's supposed to open at the National Gallery in June is perhaps going to have to wait, which is really a pity. But so much is a pity, let's just face it. But anyway, moving on. Um, the, the, but the, but his use of, of, of Mirandi has never really been discussed. And mm. the thing you're talking about is, the tabletop line, which uh, Mirandi, if you see pictures of Mirandi's studio, he put those um, bottles at eye level often and used this, which now is horizon line, and put mm -hmm. the bottles, and as you said, they make them feel monumental. But it becomes horizon and tabletop um, as a kind of a double metaphor. And pr the, the, with the beauty of that slippage is, the edge of a table versus the edge of a horizon, the mm. distance is so obviously uh, reversed. Yeah. And I love that slippage where you can play with those two things. Um, and I see that in Gustin in his use of composition so much in the way he piled things up. The way um, 
Mirandi clustered things and piled them and created these shapes. It just is like there couldn't be two more different painters, but I just saw those. And I think for painters, the difference, I, I saw Phyllis Tuckman's out there somewhere. Good old Phyllis, not old, I'm sorry. Good, I'm old. Phyllis, are you there? We're gonna pull Phyllis out of, out of the ether there, she, unless she went away. Phyllis, um, I, uh, one thing, this difference between art historians and artists is we don't have to prove anything. We could just shoot the shit here and just say, yeah. I, I see a relation. Hey, Phyllis, how you doing? Oh, Lisa, you've been so good. I love you talking I, about I like, You're like my mom. I always see the top of her head in the ceiling. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's how my mom does FaceTime. She I always see the ceiling. Um, but anyway, so the but the but the um don't you don't you see like we don't have to prove anything, we don't have to footnote anything. We can say, I see a relationship here and here, and I put it together. Now another person can go figure that out. But um I, I'm I'm convinced of this con connection. Totally. I mean that's why you're an artist and I'm an art historian. Getting behind you. Why we see Clemente behind you? What's That's going cool. on here? Yeah, it's a very, very old print. But Lisa, um, H. W. Jansen once said that art historians tidy up art history so artists can mess it up. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's you look fun. great, Phyllis. Thank you. Art critics should always stay on the side of the artist. Totally. We're always that's right. That's why Brooklyn Rail. By the way, Rail. That's by the way artists, Rail. artists are always right. <laughs> Good artists are always right. Okay, well, I didn't want to say that, but, you know, anyway. Lisa, yes. Lisa, uh, my guest critic thing for the Rail was titled, No One Gets to Be Right. Okay. And that's what I always say to my students is what I love about art, and the reason I'm not an art historian, even though I studied it, is that I've gotten into being wrong and like, you know, that art, art, there's no one really gets to be right in art. You can be right in your own work. You can be right. But, you know, like, it's like, you know, can, can you I tell mean, that Franco story? Kind of said can that you? in his own way back in the day. Like, you know, I could say the opposite about something and who could prove me wrong. Okay. Cause this is uh, between you and I, um, I loved your story about how you stood up and told Roberta something. Oh. And that's such a great story for everyone. And also it's so flattering to both you and Roberta. I love the story. Can you repeat that story? I think it's great. Yeah, sure. So I you don't did know. It publicly. You did it publicly. No, 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 no. I will. But look, Roberta and I became fast, fast friends after this incident. So it just proved my, I mean, I tell my students, she, by way of Donald Judd and Gary Indiana, were my influences as a writer. But Gary was writing for The Voice. I loved how he could write a review about what happened on the way to the gallery. And it was like the best thing ever written on that person's work. Um, I mean, I'm a disciple of Frank O'Hara. So with that said, some of you in New York will remember this panel at the Cooper Union that started WAC, the Women's Action Coalition, was started after that panel. And on the dais were all these amazing people, including Roberta. Roberta had just written, which to all of us in New York, this review of Matthew Barney's first show at Barbara Gladstone. Um, and it was written the length that normally like a museum show is reviewed. So it's me and a bunch of my friends, uh, a very famous curator who I won't name came out of that opening at Barbara Gladstone and said, all I have to say is he better put out or shut up. You know, so this moment of like identity politics. You mean, oh, you mean the fact that Matthew daughter, was not gay? Uh, you should be ashamed of yourself. Don't you understand that Matthew Barney is perfect for an art world that prefers its gay artists be straight, its black artists be white, and its women artists be men? And the, <laughs> the whole audience stood up with standing ovation. No, but I think I think the interesting well, that. but the interesting thing is, and I hope and I think that that's what part of like is that is is that people should be able to disagree and then become friends and sort of shift and change each other. And, and, and it's sort of a, I, I find it a fascinating um, story that, you know, first of all, you, you had the balls to do it. And then she was grand enough to like 
be uh, open to you in that and I, told sort of, I was right actually I didn't say that you told me you were right okay but but also didn't you say you edited a thing for the Brooklyn Rail where you had everyone write yeah, something yeah. that they were wrong about yes and I think that's really interesting that that what 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 you were wrong about so what were you wrong about Oh, in like 1989, 1990, I made this flip comment about Felix Gonzalez Torres, of all people, Felix <laughs> Gonzalez Torres, saying like, ah, it's just like the flyers that we get bombarded with on the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, clueless. Felix and I became friends, you know, like made up for an earlier writing, but, you know, I wear it as a badge of honor now. That like, but, it, but, it, but that, but I think what's interesting is if we don't walk, if we don't run away from what happened there, if we look at it psychoanalytically, which of course I like to look at everything either analytically or psychoanalytically, it's really important that you saw it that way at first because the truth is that the work really is like that. But you just took it the wrong way as opposed to saying it's a good thing. See, real art or good art is supposed to, you know, this idea of the avant-garde, the idea that we're supposed to be punching holes in the universe and opening up portals to new universes, opening people's minds. I'm amazed at how often people really just want their same flavor of lollipop day in and day out to comfort themselves. And they don't really want to be challenged. No one really wants challenge because change is so hard. Now, you know, in a time like this, we're all going to have to learn to change. And that is, I think, a big part of what people forget. It. I mean, the, 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 the impact um, economically and also, obviously, a lot of lo a lot loss of lives is. But I think that even for those people who aren't going to have a dramatic impact personally, I think just don't like being forced to change like anything. I mean, you know, I, 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 it's shocking to change. I mean, um, and I think it's, that, that may be one tiny good thing that might force people to wake themselves into a general sense of change, hopefully without too, too much um, personal tragedy. Um, but I think that that, going back to the art world, it's, it's, I think that that's always come as a surprise to me. Like, I took you guys seriously when, meaning you guys, I mean, I, I, that I thought, I was supposed to challenge you. And then I heard differently, like, how come you're not, or like Gustin, I'm not comparing myself to Gustin, though I would try to aspire to be that, def, you know, defiled in my late work, you know, like, uh, you know, people calling me a stumble bum, you know, that would be awesome, you know? So, so I guess for the young artists, I was like, you know, don't try to please everybody because there is not going to be an economy for the art market, I suppose, the way it had been, moving forward so you have a great opportunity to do whatever the f you want and just take take them on go for it shock them shock yourself you know do not please if you Thank can you, possibly Lisa. do that is that is that are we wrapping or are we going for another question if, if you're good to stay i think there's plenty um, of questions my hunger on. passed they say that about fasting it, it comes and goes anybody want to leave that's the cool thing you leave i'm here <laughs> so we had a question from chan bum park from earlier chan bum do you want to uh, unmute yourself or i can help you with that if you know hello my name is chan bum and i'm a student at sva and i have a question about are you in your parents house yes i can tell <laughs> i'm in the basement uh, hi hi chan bum and I want to ask about uh, whether there's such a thing as a good male gaze, because male gaze is objectifies woman's body. And what do you think? I want. I, I I hope there is a good male gaze if um, the male wishes to be the female, like in his fantasy. I think it's all good. It's what you do with it. I mean, there's a difference between real life and art. Yeah. Um, I think that you know, I'm not, I've never advocated, you know, um, the objectification of women in the real world. And if anybody who knows me knows that, you know, uh, you know, I, I you know, uh, feel very strongly. Um, I'm watching the Hillary documentary and man, it's like, I feel like I'm mind melding with the, you know, like just the, out, the how angry she was at like being, um, you know, having to get her hair done you know, and all, you know, just these kind of things, like, I, I just could really feel for, for, you know, her as, as in, in that documentary and sort of what she was going through as a candidate, as opposed to a male. 
so yeah, I mean, the 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 inequities are not really um, something that the things that I'm talking about in work are really um, very different than what I would actually say in the real world. I often sort of representing things in a kind of a more dreamlike way, and sometimes in our dreams, things are very wrong and imperfect, and we often take on the role of the other, like Gustin inhabiting the clansmen, you know, he was, or, or like Isaac Babel riding around with the Red Army. It's just sometimes you find things, when I was working with some of those earlier paintings where it, you know, the conversation around the male gaze came up a lot, um, I uh, was interested in almost like being like Isaac Babel and I was imagining myself as a misogynist. And what would it be like? And it was, um, it, it, it definitely um, was, was, a, was a dangerous uh, thing, just like it was for these other artists that I admire. Do you think? I do not a... promote misogyny, but I understand why people could imagine that I was, just I don't think that Philip Gustin was promoting anti Semitism. Do you think there's still a permission for artists, male artists, to paint the female body in this era? Only if you're doing it in an interesting and new and fresh and amazing way. But if you're making crap, just don't bother. Thank you. You're welcome. Say hi to your parents. Thank you. I will. Be, um, nice, we... be nice to girls. <laughs> uh, we also have a question from Mimi. Mimi Pino, do you want to unmute yourself? Isn't this amazing, this forum that you guys, the, the rail really just rallied here, didn't they? Get this thing done. Hi, thank you for doing this. Oh, I love the backdrops. Those are amazing. Yeah, I'm kind of in a cave. Um, <laughs> in Baltimore. You're um, in Baltimore. Yeah, Mike is online classes now, so we're all kind of stuck in our houses, but uh, we get to do this, so. Are you an art student? Yeah, I'm a painting MFA. So you know I'm having my show come there in the fall. I didn't know that actually. I saw your um, your show like two years ago in New York. Um, well, I'm having a show that's coming to Baltimore at the Art Museum there. Christopher uh, Bedford is bringing the show that's in Aspen there and hopefully it will be open to the public in the fall. Let's all stay safe and kind of, what do they call that, flatten the curve so we can actually maybe one at a time go look at my work and leave the museum. <laughs> but in the meantime, what was your question? Um, so I had a question about your, like the relationship between light and color in your paintings. And you talked about sort of the tenderness of light. Um, and I wondered if you thought about light as a character. Definitely. As well. Yeah. Definitely. Light, light is a loving kind of almost the presence of, of, of God or, you know, like, you know, I was relate raised in a way that I, believe in a, a presence and sometimes I sort of believe in you know just you know we call it that but it's just a kind of a you know in 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 Wallace Stevens he says uh, light the first light of evening is in a room and then somewhere later in the poem he says um, uh, a light the um, a mirror it, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it but um, the, the miraculous influence. It's just like that light is a miraculous influence. It's like it wraps around people. It, it's, it's, a, it's a goodness in a way. It's like I always thought of light and painting as, 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 the, as the more loving and positive. While, while maybe I'm sticking a figure, like there's one of these earlier paintings, I remember she's like, it's called Blonde with Diapers and Toothpick. That's not exactly kind. Um, but then I sort of wrapped her in this loving envelope of color and light. Because I do feel that we are not all one thing. We are very conflicted pe as people. Most people have, um, on, on a good day, many different things. I'm sure that for some people that you even love, like one minute you could feel something uh, negative and then something positive right on top of it. So why wouldn't you do that in your work with your own imagery or even towards yourself? You know, it's like, it's not one thing. I think that uh, something that's been very important to me in my life has been to try to embrace complexity and conflictedness. 
And I remember in the early 90s, one of the things that the complaints I used to get was people would say, what do you mean by this work? And I would sort of, you know, bristle and not really want to sort of say, well, I, I can put the, you know, I can put the uh, bullet in the gun, but I'm not going to pull the trigger. I think that that's the pleasure of the viewer, you know, but also as you grow as a viewer, as you change as a viewer, even me for my own work or for me looking at another artist's work or, you know, now that I'm watching the Criterion Collection or whatever, if I get a chance to read a book that I hadn't read again, you know, looking at movies that I hadn't seen, you know, I'm now 58 years old. I saw this movie when I was 23 years old. It's going to be a different movie. So I think that like, you know, being able to sort of go, th I mean, you asked about light, now I'm talking about other things, but at any rate, I think, I guess that's the thing is that yes, because it's a character, it, it's always been a kind and loving presence. And um, and I do find that, you know, reading um, Wallace Stevens, and he often refers to um, the imagination. He, so he, he, there are lines where he says, God and the imagination are one. and um, and I think that that he just means that God is the imagination. What we can imagine is is it's like everything. So we can, you know, that you know, as they said in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, if you can dream it, be it. So it's just like in your work, you know, um, it doesn't have to. I think you have to be willing to accept, like I said, that things are not simple. That that things are that you can maintain a multiplicity of thought that things do not, you know, that things do not have, um, too often people have trouble with gray or whatever because it's too many nuances. There's so many grays. There's only one black and one white. And everyone is always trying for the black or the white. And that's always what goes on. And I think that to develop yourself uh, emotionally or sort of like you, 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 as an artist, you, you have to have a lot of range, emotional range and be able to withstand that because often people want you to go towards the more extreme. That's not what you were expecting me to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Who's that handsome fellow? Sorry. Oh, we're Mimi's in somebody's there. kitchen there now. Oh, there. Jared Grimes. Oh, it's, it's Christopher's son. Some, or did you have a question, Jared? Somebody unmute that young man. I, you, whether you like it or not, you're on the screen full. How did uh, Sophia, did you get Jared? Hi, Jared. Do you want to say something, Jared? You're going to unmute you for a moment. He didn't really even have a question, but somehow Christopher's son, Jared, popped up. He's still muted. Jared, the last time I saw you were playing the um, Mercury Lounge. You can maybe do it in sign language. <laughs> I was studying, by the way, one thing we should all do is learn something new that we would never do. I'm trying to teach myself to do gouache. And I, I think a couple of years ago, I was trying to do American Sign Language. Why not? You got hours, you know? It's like, teach yourself something new. And then we could do this through sign language. Jared's still muted, obviously. I think Jared might not have a microphone connected because I'm oh. unable to unmute Okay, it's, oh. it's on your side. But anyway, hi, Jared. Hello, Jared. <laughs> Anybody um, else? Want yeah, we... Maybe we can take a question from Nancy Munford now, who's who's been very active and had a few different questions. Nancy, I'm going to unmute you, okay? <clears throat> Lisa, I don't know if you remember me. I used to live downstairs from me in Hoboken, above the Hoboken Farm Boy in 1985. That's right. You guys got arrested for growing pot, right? We did. My husband did, yeah. Um, well, I got arrested the next year for for serving a minor. So I had a major, I was thrown in the police station. The Hoboken police were crazy. Yeah. They really, I did not say that I went to, uh, I was an artist. I thought that they, I would never be seen alive again. So yeah. hey, hey. I don't know who narked, I don't know who narked us out. It wasn't it you guys. So. It was, no, it wasn't me. I didn't <laughs> even know anything about the pot. I would have enjoyed smoking some, I guess. But um, it was uh, a crazy time. Do you know who took your loft over after you left? No. Uh, okay, this is gonna be, this is crazy, but it, it was taken over um, by Donald Judd. You're kidding me. No, this is this is so wild. So there was this family that moved in, and they built the they built out like a hundred little rooms in that loft. So guys, so I lived Our in loft? Hoboken. 
Yeah, yeah, your loft. So I we should give him a little background in, what it was that where we lived. We lived at in Hoboken. John Curran just called me from Hoboken. I don't know what the hell he and Rachel were doing in Hoboken. They were looking for some something that her sister, who's a vet, the meaning like a veterinarian, um, said that they should get at some pharmacy that would be blocking yeah. the virus. I don't know. So they were driving. Oh, and John Curran calls me up because he, he was living with us when you were there, right? Because John, Matvey, and I all shared this loft in Hoboken. It was nothing kinky going on, guys. I'm just saying. I didn't know he lived there, but... 4,000 square foot loft for like 1,500 bucks. We couldn't afford it ourselves. So we had to share it with John. We got John as a roommate. But anyway, so they just called me. They're like, what number was that on Washington Street? Do you remember 44 something? Anyway, Ooh, I don't so know. These were enormous lofts with like, and they, our loft was painted pink for some reason. And we just left it like that because we couldn't afford to paint it. But it was our, our particular loft. Was, and then Nancy and her husband, who Hi. I remember him as designing ships or something. Yeah, yeah. he still does. Yeah, yeah, he's a professor now. Okay, so um, anyway, so they lived below us. It was like two or three lofts. And then there was this place on the ground floor called the Farm Boy, which was a like a, yeah, like early health food store. We grasped and, you. And um, so when you guys moved out, I think you got maybe moved out after the you know, kind of got busted or something. 89 but, we moved. Yeah, so they left. And then um, this family moved in and they make like a million little cubicles and I was like what's going on in there and then I heard I met the woman her name's Ellie and um Ellie uh and I became friends and she was working for an artist she was his secretary his, you know his go-to and I was like I never heard of Donald Judd because by the way Donald Judd was famous if you cared about Donald Judd but it wasn't like now yeah where, and, and actually um Donald's kids love this story love the story because they, they 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 feel like you know it's so important that people know that there was a time when donald was you know he was a big deal amongst certain circles but he was not a big deal you know like the way he is now and i was like oh no i remember this i was thinking oh wow he must be pretty successful if he can afford to rent a loft somewhere else for his secretary but she <laughs> had like some kids and they all lived there and she was doing donald judd stuff but like judd's kids were running around and I, I didn't know who the hell he was. And then I had no now, idea. now I'm showing at the gallery. And actually, it's funny because, um, you know, it was just, it's just a weird, bizarre history. Anyway, hi. It is, but the, I remember coming up to your studio. We didn't know each other very well. We were neighbors. But I remember coming up to your studio and you were doing, I don't think you were showing then, but you were doing very small kind of square um, small encaustic portraits and I had never seen anyone do encaustic before and you were showing me all the wax and everything but it was only a few years after that where you were showing these more sexualized female forms and it, it seems to happen quite fast that you you moved into kind of your your thing what you're still doing right well uh, I felt from I felt those early portraits yeah, and well, I remember I was, Matt Faye's work then too, which was nice. Yeah, I was very lost then. And, you know, I was just struggling to figure out what I wanted to do. And I yeah. was, you know, getting lost in all these different techniques, like encaustic with yeah. my, heat, my heat gun. Yeah. You know. <laughs> exactly. Actually, there was an encaustic painting in the small painting show that really held up from that, from that um, time. It, and, and it's called Week of Sundays. And I now have it hanging in my studio. I actually Instagrammed it a few weeks ago before I fled New York. Um, and I actually bought a picture light for it and kind of put it up, but it was actually from that actual loft and you probably saw that one. Yeah. But it, it um, yeah, it, it, it happened quickly, except at that time of your life, you know, every week, it's slow. Every, it's, <laughs> lo it's slow. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, what happened is when Maffey and I moved to Ludlow Street after we left Hoboken, I mean, I left Hoboken for similar reasons as you, which is I got arrested and kind of got to get the fuck out of there because it's scary. I said, I'm going to go to the big city where they got bigger fish to fry than me. <laughs> and um, I, I, we lived on Ludlow Street. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I had a show of those paintings and I just found it really depressing because I did not see myself in the paintings. Yeah. And I thought I would stop painting. And that's when I toyed with the idea of becoming a filmmaker because I thought that painting was kind of weighing me down and I, as, 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 a, as a medium. You know, um, and 
then Mate, um, through various things, um, sort of the story goes, I was disinvited to uh, a party. Somebody left a message on the answering machine and said, Mate, we would like you to come, but Lisa, nobody wants her there. These are friends from Yale, ha, huh? not good friends. But they said, we, nobody really wants her there because she's too much. And Mate, and I was like, who the hell gets disinvited to a party? And then Mate actually very wisely said, because I was like posing the problems I had with the work. And he said, you know, you're so like, you're the kind of person that gets disinvited to a party, but your work is so demure and that's giving you trouble. Why don't you switch personalities with your work and why don't you have your party get, your paintings get disinvited to the party and you become more demure. That's great. And, and as it turned out, you know, I did not get more demure, but you know, I, I, I shaved a couple of corners off myself, a few, but um, yeah. Man. So sorry to interrupt guys, but do you think we could squeeze in one last question before yeah. we have to wrap up with our poem? Um, oh yeah, the poem, we got to save time, but um, thank so, you, Kat nice to see you. You too. Um, so I'm gonna queue up Kathy Bradford who had a final question. Kathy, I'm unmuting you. Hey Kathy, great artist. Hello Lisa. Hey. Thank you, Sophia. Um, one thing I learned about this interview, this uh, panel with you, is that you're not shy at all. <laughs> and my question is, does the way you paint breasts have to do with your relationship with your own breasts? Mm, not at all. What, what, what would you imagine? I feel like there's a question behind, or a, a thought, a, a, a statement behind the question. What, what, would the, what would you imagine my relationship to my breast be? Big. Would, big? Nah. <laughs> Only when I'm overweight. My breasts are really small when I'm at the right weight, but then when I gain weight, uh, then they kind of bump up a bit. Uh, <laughs> See, I, I knew you could handle this. <laughs> oh, I have no problem with the question. I just, it's just never been about really, it's never really been about my, me. The, 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 it's really a lot of, it's, it's, it's always been kind of a, if it was about me, I think it, 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 it would not have been as interesting for anyone. Um, and I just think it's really, um, I saw this as sort of an otherness that not all women, like some of the women that I painted, I saw as otherness as much as, you know, as if, it, I, you know, like I was not the same species as the thing I was painting. And so it was really sort of um, looking at things in, 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 in a much more three in a multi dimensional way. And as I said, you know, I sort of really did get permission in some ways uh, from early readings of Diane Arbus looking at free you know like her imagining one of the things i found really important about studying diane arbus when i was younger was how she really didn't see the of uh, the others and that was so important in her work is that she was photographing these sort of an other anotherness um but she did her best work when they she really identified with them and but she th they were so different but then she was sort of trying to bring herself closer at one point i said somebody I used to get very offended um, when people would call the images bimbos. And I'd say, I, I never really thought of it as bimbos. I actually think that, that, you know, there's a kind of way in which through painting, I was trying to sort of create some form of trying to elevate something that was really low, it was kind of like a high low thing. And, you know, also, it's not, it, it, you know, it, it, it was, it was really sort of an experiment in a way. Like when I was first starting out, these were just, th these were just like experiments, like as art was, you know? So, you know, I just sort of, you know, looking at um, er, like Mike Kelly's shows or things like that and sort of thinking this kind of weird lower middle class sensibility, I thought, how could you deploy that in painting? You know, because painting always felt since, or the way I misunderstood painting was as this of sort of um, a very kind of um, uh, high pursuit. And I don't think, and I had to figure out a way to sort of come at it a little bit differently. And I felt like, you know, when I would look at Mike's sculptures, I would think, 
how could you make something like that into a painting? What would be the, the what? And so I was experimenting with ways of doing that. I mean, actually the breasts, when I first made them, I was actually, in, I was actually um, interested in um, paintings, like the idea of, this actually came a little bit more out of, um, because when I was a student, I remember one of the things that I was always told was to make a painting flat. And because I came up in the, in the early 80s through school and, you know, abstract expressionism and flatness was something that was being taught. And I remember knowing that I wanted to be a figurative artist um, for some reason. And I decided that I remember saying, I don't even know how to, I understood that flatness was rejecting um, pictorial perspective. And I said, well, first, shouldn't I know how to make something round before I know how to make it flat? And so um, I became kind of interested in the kind of perversity of form making and making something very volumetric, like highlight, light, shadow, cast, cast shadow, reflected light, as a way of kind of creating a perverse um, opposition to flatness and the um, and the acad the academy that I st where I studied the academies of art um, I just felt like it didn't make sense so I kind of when I so the most perfect uh, round thing and the sort of the most pervert so it was like layering perversity on top of perversity would be to paint a breast and yes I do have perfect breasts for anybody who wants to know Kathy okay they're perfect thank God. Thank God. <laughs> as long as I, as long as long, <laughs> no, I, I, I really appreciate your, your question and I love your work. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank we'll you. Talk, we'll talk later. So let's get the poet on. Yes. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, Fong. Let me take this moment also to plug next week's schedule. Um, we've got Charles Bernstein with Erica Hunt on Monday, Jillian Jacob, our dance editor, and Tara Aisha Willis on Tuesday our very own Jason Rosenfeld with Cecily Brown on Wednesday, and our dance editors, Gina Tellerly and Dan Sullivan on Thursday. And finally on Friday, Fong Bui with Julian Schnabel. So. Ooh, ooh. Can everyone yes. hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, Lisa, Terry, thank you very much. Um, I was thinking of uh, reading that Stevens poem, but I, I've got an Adrian Rich poem in mind instead. Um, Can you do both? I could. Let's do both. We, you know, we went on forever here, so why not? Yeah, all right, a double do the one you want first. Okay, I'll, I'll end with the Stevens. So this is Adrian Rich's What Kind of Times Are These? There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows, near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappeared into those shadows. I've walked there picking mushrooms at the edge of dread, but don't be fooled, this isn't a Russian poem. This is not somewhere else but here. Our country moving closer to its own truth and dread, its own way of making people disappear. I won't tell you where the place is, the dark mesh of the woods, meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost-ridden crossroads, leaf mold paradise. I know already who wants to buy it, sell it, and make it disappear. But I won't tell you where it is, so why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. We got the Stevens. Okay. So this is Wall Stevens' poem, Final Soliloquy of the Interior Paramour. Light of the first light of evening, as in a room in which we rest, and for small reason, think the world imagined is the ultimate good. This is therefore the intensest rendezvous. It is in that thought that we collect ourselves out of all of the indifferences into one thing, within a single thing, a single shawl, wrapped tightly around us since we are poor, a warmth, a light, a power, the miraculous influence. Here now, we forget each other and ourselves. We feel the obscurity of an order, a whole, a knowledge, that which arranged the rendezvous. And within its vital boundary, in the mind, we say God and the imagination are one. How high that highest candle lights the dark. Out of this same light, out of the central mind, 
we make a dwelling in the evening air in which being there together is enough. Wow, thank you for reading that. Thank you. And the other poem was great too. Can you, um, can you guys share those? Sure thing. Uh, I believe Jason Rosenfeld just dropped one of them in the chat. Yeah. Now, will the chat be available for a little while? Um, or is that something? Um, I can different? send it to you downloaded. And uh, so everyone knows this will be on YouTube, hopefully by this afternoon, as are all our other talks and our future talks. So oh, that's great. should you want to re-reference. Um, thank you, everyone, for staying with us. We still have 160 people after our two, you know, an hour and a half. So Most of them are my has... relatives. Most of them are <laughs> <laughs> um, we... Everyone has a wonderful day. From, from, LA, from LA, just thank you to everyone. Lisa, thank you so much. It was fantastic to reconnect with you yesterday and now today. So now we're going to keep our party stuff going. And, 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 um, and one thing you want to um, talk about is still show? here. You, can you talk about that? Oh, yeah. Show? I'm looking for canzaborg.com. My pet show is named show, A Cloud in the Box is on live. But um, um, Christopher, if you're still here, again, thank you for joining us. That made it even extra more extra special for me. So thank you, everyone. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Feel free to say bye as you log off. You go get some lunch. Go get some lunch now. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Bye. 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 Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Bye, Kenny. Bye. 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 Bye, bye, Candida. Bye, Elizabeth. Bye, Kim. Bye, Robert. Ciao, everyone. Ciao. <laughs>